Good evening. Welcome to the December 18th regular town council meeting. If we could have Deputy Mayor Martino, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton? Here. Councillor Forrest is unable to attend. Councillor Hurley? Here. Councillor Latina? Here. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor Rell? Here. Councillor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morin Bello? Here. Thank you. So we, it looks like we have an item to add to the agenda tonight. Do we have a motion? To add the bid to the agenda. Motion to add the bid to the agenda. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Abstaining? Motion passes. And we'll begin tonight with a presentation on the medical claim audit. We have Greg Curtin from the Insurance Committee and Chris Monroe, our agent of record here. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Again, uh, Greg Curtin for the Insurance Committee. Uh, we've been talking about doing an audit, having it performed on uh, Anthem uh, uh, <coughs> Management of the Town and the Board of Education's health claims for the past few years. Uh, the audit grew out of the town's role as the planned fiduciary and the town's obligation to safeguard the interests of their health and welfare. We discussed this with Mike O'Neill, we discussed it with Jeff Bridges last year, and they gave us the go-ahead to do that. Uh, we came to the council and uh, for funding. You folks agreed, and we really appreciate that. Uh, it's been done, and uh, Chris, our agent of record, is gonna just give us the quick results for that. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Chris Monroe. I am a vice president with USI Insurance Services, and I serve as the town's agent of record. Um, to pick up on what Greg touched upon, um, I did hand out a one-page talking points overview that will speak to where we were, where we are, and the results of the recently completed audit. Um, if you go back and look at the audit history, um, we began this process a number of years ago at the insurance committee level. Uh, in the course of those discussions, we talked about the viability of the audit. We talked about the town's role as the planned fiduciary and the importance of making sure we safeguard the town's interest in looking at Anthem as our claim administrator and making sure that they were pro operating in a proper fashion. I think it's important to note that Anthem has been our carrier for a lot of years. If you just go back over the course of the last 10 years and you look at the total cost that has been pushed through the plan, you're looking at a number that approaches $100 million over a 10-year period. So this is a big line item for the town. And as is the case with all health and welfare plans, there's a lot of moving pieces when it comes to the sheer volume of claims that are processed in a given year on behalf of our employees, their spouses, and their dependents. Um, that kind of spurred the decision to move forward with, with the audit. Um, we began the audit process in January of 2016, uh, where we prepared an RFP and sent it out to the market, if you will. Um, we did have, at that point, five respondents who re replied to the RFP request. Um, we had Siegel, a company called Medbill Management, a company called CTI, HMS and BMI audit services. Uh, those five respondents are a combination of some vendors that are national in scope, whereas others are more regional in their focus. Um, the ultimate decision was to go in the direction of MedBill management. Um, if you looked at the criteria that we used, it ultimately came down to their price, which came in at about 35,000. It came in at, based upon their scope of services. So we were getting more bang for our buck, if you will, in terms of what they were willing to do on behalf of the <clears> town. <throat> and then if you look at their experience, they were a little bit deeper locally in regards to other municipal clients that they had worked on. Um, they had a prior relationship with Meriden. They had a prior relationship with the town of Mansfield. They had a prior relationship uh, with Southington. 
um, all existing Anthem clients. So not only do they have a pretty good track record, they had a good price, they were offering more services. They certainly had a little bit of a foothold in this area on auditing local Anthem business. So that ultimately led to us picking Medbill. If you look at the scope of the project, it boiled down into two areas, if you will. Um, they were retained to do a dependent audit and a medical claims audit. Um, if you look at the results that were present that was presented to the insurance committee a couple months back um, Here's the information that grew out of the work done by Medbill um, the dependent audit focused on Roughly a thousand members who are on the plan and when I say members I mean those employees that are covering themselves a spouse or themselves a spouse and a dependent and the goal was pretty simple, to make sure that any spouse or dependent who is enrolled for coverage is a valid dependent. Um, what we found in going through the audit was we had 15 people who essentially self-selected out of the plan, uh, four spouses and 11 children. When you look at the reasons for self-selection, it's centered upon uh, children who were covered under <coughs> other plans, um, children who might not have been true children, uh, maybe a grandchild arrangement. Um, certainly not done intentional, done more out of ignorance than anything else. But at the end of the day, we found uh, 15 people that self-selected out of the plan. Um, what Medbill also te uh, tests for is what's called coordination of benefits. Um, if you have a situation where you have a dependent who is covered not only under this plan but another plan, you want to make sure you have it lined up as to who pays primary, who pays secondary. Um, we had some instances where we had about 27 additional employees that were kind of put into the right bucket when it comes to an order of pay situation where they might have been set up as primary under the Weathersfield plan, where they might have been pri should have been primary under another spouse's or another parent's plan. So a couple things grew out of some checks and balances there. Um, when you look at what we estimated the savings to be on a go forward basis, um, we put the number at between 45 and $55,000 a year. Um, so that is what we call claim avoidance. You take those people off the plan, you put people in the proper bucket from a coordination of benefits standpoint. We looked at the actual claims that were generated on those people uh, over the course of the prior two years, and we came up with a future avoidance uh, cost in the range of that forty-five or fifty thousand um, dollars. On the claim audit, um, what we found was that Medbill went back and did a two-year audit of all claims that were processed by Anthem. And if you look at the dollar value of that two-year claim amount, you're looking at about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 in claims. Um, Medbill was happy to report that Anthem has served us well from an administrative standpoint. Um, we found very little in the form of errors relative to problems on the Anthem side. Um, we were able to tabulate about $5,500 in recovery and a small number when measured against a $16,000 uh, spend line. Um, when you look at some of the drivers behind that $5,500 recovery, again, there were some COB issues uh, where Anthem was paying primary where they should have paid secondary. Um, we had some issues relative to duplicate claims, uh, one or two claims that were paid twice that were caught in the audit. Um, we had some retroactive termination issues where you'll have somebody who is taken <coughs> off the plan Anthem will go back three, four months, terminate that person, but in a few instances, they didn't go back and claw back the claims that were paid on uh, that individual's behalf. Uh, and finally, we found in one instance where they paid for a benefit that was excluded under the plan. So when you look at the sheer scope and volume of claims, to have a $5,500 recovery kind of validates what we were all hoping, which uh, was Anthem, you know, is and was serving as a good fiduciary or good uh, claims payer, if you will, for the town. <laughs> and again, we felt good in terms of what the audit was able to drive for the town. Um, we satisfied our fiduciary responsibility and we got a recovery effort that was equal to the money we exerted for the audit. So it became a cost neutral benefit for the town. And I think, again, this just validates that we have the right player in Anthem and that they've done a good job relative to um, paying claims on our behalf and it also reinforces I think the good job that the town and the board is doing in terms of policing who comes on the plan who comes off um, to have a thousand people and have 15 
who you find are not valid, you know, less than a 2% error rate, um, that speaks well to how the town and the board has, has managed the eligibility under the plan. So um, that's kind of a little bit of a wrap up in terms of where we were and kind of where we are now and, and the results of the work done by Medbill. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, and do we have questions from council? Jeff? Just want to clarify the claim volume re, uh, audited was 15 to 16 million. Million. Did I say thousand? Yeah. You did. Yeah. Million. Million. I million. just wanted to. I left off a couple zeros. Yeah. Just wanted to get that out there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. You. Are there any other questions? Councilor Latina? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to find out did any of the Anthem Hartford healthcare issues affect the employees? I know this would be out of the scope of the audit, or maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, no. The, 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 the period that we pulled were claims for 2015 and 2016. So that was the two year window that we audited. And uh, at that point in time, Hartford Hospital was part of the Anthem network. So we didn't find any irregularities when it came to Hartford Hospital and the paying of claims. Um, I don't know at this point, and we haven't heard of anybody who has found their claims now being reprocessed now that they're back in network with any errors associated with that. It's still kind of early. You know, that ar arrangement was just done three weeks ago. They're reprocessing claims retroactive to 10-1. It's probably gonna be in another four or five weeks when we'll see if there are issues. Those issues start to present themselves. Um, the way they'll present themselves is you'll have members who will come and say, hey, I thought this was gonna be paid in network. It's supposed to be processed in network and I'm still seeing it hit me under the out of network level of benefit. So I think it's still too early to tell whether we have an issue there, but that you do raise a very good point and need to monitor that on an ongoing basis. And Anthem will notify you should there be any issues? It's really more the member who will reach out to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the position that Anthem has taken is those claims were originally processed out of network. We'll now go back in and reprocess them in, in network. That'll result in a new explanation of benefit going out to the member. Probably does make some sense for the town and the board to send out a notice that says if the EOB doesn't look right, then certainly either bring it to my attention or, or the town and the board and we can look into it. But it's really an anthem driven mm -hmm. kind of correction, if you will, on that reprocessing. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris, thank you for that information. Quick question, this may be for Jeff. How often do we do these audits? How often are they recommended? Yep. And I'll just applaud you that it was cost neutral, which is yep. great in these yep. tough times. But yep. in terms of doing these audits on a regular basis, what's recommended or what have we done? You know, I'll give you the long answer. Um, years ago, they were done on a more frequent basis. Years ago being 10, 12, 15 years ago. And the reason for that was a lot of vendors did it on contingency. So they would go in and say, I'll make this very easy for you. I'll do this for free. And any recovery, I keep 30, 40% of it. So you had a lot more people willing to do it. Um, what you found is that technology improved. Claims that in the old days, in many instances, came in manually, now come in electronically. Um, and technology is good. So you found fewer and fewer errors, which resulted in these companies saying, hey, it can no longer do it on a contingency. If I'm gonna do it, I need to charge X amount of dollars, whether I find something or not. So you went from an environment where they were done often to now an environment where people would say, geez, do I really want to spend thirty-five, forty, fifty thousand dollars if I don't see any tangible evidence that something's wrong? I think what kind of pushed us to do it is again the planned fiduciary issue. Okay. Where, you know, we're the stewards of a ten, eleven million dollar line item each and every year. And I'm not advocating you do it every two or three years, but I do think periodically um, it's imprudent to step in and say, let's make sure it's done right. So I, you know, again, long answer, but the old days it was done often. Last 10 years, you don't see a lot of employers doing it because of concerns relative to cost up front. And if there's no evidence of her issue, then they typically don't like to pursue it. Makes sense. Thank yep. you. Yep. Are there any other questions? Councilor Rell? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, when it comes to the dependents who were, um, on their parents' plans. Yeah. Was it the change with Obamacare at age 26? Was that a factor at all? I mean, what, what kept, I guess, dependence on uh, the plans 
Yeah, I think a lot of it was inertia. I think a lot of it was, hey, I'm the 25-year-old. And we saw a few, a few instances where this emerged. You know, I'm the 24, the 25-year-old. I'm working. I get it through my employer, but I'm also on my parents' plan. Okay. And, you know, if you are that employee who's covering yourself, a spouse, one child, you don't pay any extra for that third, second or third child. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of out of sight, out of mind. So the way we managed this or the way MedBill managed it was, hey, listen, you have to validate your dependents. And to the extent in which you don't, you lose coverage entirely as of this date. So it kind of forced everybody to call in and revisit. And that's where we saw a lot of people saying, hey, the more I look at this thing, the more I realize, why do I want to cover my child here? Mm -hmm. When in fact they can get coverage through their own employer, all right, we're going to move that child off the plan. Okay. Um, I think we had one or two instances. And again, it was all you know, not malicious. It was, uh, I've had custody of my, I've, I've been looking after my grandkids for years. You know, not recognized by the court, but just looking after them, I've got a child, the child's had some issues, I'm taking care of my grandkids. Not recognized by the court, which rules that grandchild out as a legally qualified dependent. So we saw an instance where those folks got moved off the plan. So those were kind of some of the things that jumped out as far as cleaning things up uh, on, these, okay. on these 15 folks. Yeah, I figured it would, had to have been somewhere around the 24, 25 year old. It is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was certainly a lot, little bit of that that kind of bubbled up through this process. And again, I think a lot of it was out of sight, out of mm -hmm. mind. You know, I Not haven't malicious. changed anything. And, you know, this is kind of an opportunity. And when you say to somebody, you got to call in or you're off, you get 100 percent response. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you. Any other questions? No. OK. Thank right. you very much, Chris, for your thorough. Review. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. You too. Okay, uh, moving into general comments, uh, we have public comment, and again, I just remind you, you have five minutes to speak. Anybody from the public wishing to speak tonight? Lee, come on up. You can just do that. Dolores, Dolores has one. Lee Sikis, uh, Ward 17 Walls Road. I want to mention a few things. Congratulations to the new members of the council. And uh, hopefully uh, the town will do better this year with snow awareness for the pedestrians and the corners and the people that uh, drive. Because really, uh, we haven't had it bad yet but we already had some places that are warned going into the streets that stayed on the sidewalk in the past week alone. And that's not good. Another thing I want to mention is uh, going back several months, when they were fixing all the corners, the curb cuts to uh, the state along the Sestian Highway, uh, I talked with uh, Jeff Bridges, and I talked with uh, um, Derek, and I talked with uh, Somebody from the state. As a matter of fact, Derek, myself, and somebody from the state met one day down by uh, two intersections, Sestine and uh, Wells, and uh, down by uh, Wells uh, by uh, Maple Street. Some of the improvements that the state made, I would not call them improvements at all. I had photos. Derek has them now. Of the border two that you could see a night and day difference from good to worst. The thing with it is, uh, some of you go back 10, 12 years on the council or have been active in the community that far back, but uh, just the fact that there's an issue of public safety, uh, having also those signs removed by the state that said yield to pedestrians, and uh, the state, according to Mr. Bridges, and the state themselves telling me, uh, well, the walk sign is uh, warrants enough of a warning to the drivers for it to be considered a safety uh, enough. 
Well, I don't consider that safety enough in many cases. As a matter of fact, the signs say uh, you ought to look out for cars, but the traffic lights don't say look out for pedestrians. But uh, one thing I want to say is, uh, like I said, going back 10, 12 years ago, uh, we had a major cost of a couple hundred thousand with Rocky Hill, the Sidesty Highway Improvement Project, before you were here, Mr. Bridges. And all the plans they had, all the ideas they had, all the money they spent, considering how the state dictates what can and can't be even done on an intersection, on a corner, that was nothing but a waste of money, an absolute waste of tax dollars. And I don't want to see the town council throw money away on anything like that in the upcoming years, like they probably did 12 years ago, give or take a few years. Can some of you remember that project, the Sizeby Improvement Project? You don't remember? No. I remember they were even going to make it safe for pedestrians to go from Rocky Hill to Westfield through uh, by the overpass of 91. Total, total ridiculous. But uh, I haven't always been here on Monday nights. I'm found something else to do on Monday nights. But I will be back on occasion. Because really, some things have to be kept better. And uh, some things are slacking. And all I can say is if we could uh, warn people about the snow banks and cars being, uh, you know, being parked there, uh, we also could also warn people about clearing the corners rather than wait for somebody to complain to have those corners cleared. And I thank you. And Happy New Year. Thank you, Mr. Sekas, and thank you for the snow removal reminder. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Gus Colantonio? Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Good evening. Uh, guess what? I still have problems with the stop sign. And uh, I'm just going to read uh, uh, an excerpt from a few months ago, I guess, you know, going back to uh, the previous mayor comments, commenting about uh, the stop sign and, and what I'm looking for. So if you bear with me, but you can feel, you can stop me anytime I go over. I, I, I don't mind that at all. Uh, this is me, I guess, but the council, the council does not have the authority to authorize the placement of any stop signs. This is the mayor talking, the ex-mayor. By charter, the council does not have the power, and he, as mayor, cannot go out there in the middle of the night and plant a stop sign so he can stop listening to this topic. And it is not within this authority and it is now within authority of the council. Skip few few lines and then it keeps on going. And it is the state's prerogative to make the decision and this, re and this report has been reviewed and examined by our local police with the state agencies and contrary to what Mr. Colantoni has said, you know. So he's, he's telling us, or he's telling me, that there is not much he can do or you can do about a stop sign. That's the way I see it. And of course, he says, Mr. Colantoni can get up every meeting and continue to ask the same question and frankly spin it to that they don't care. But he knows that it's not true and it plays well for the camera. But the truth of the matter is he knows that if they care about is concerned, and they concern themselves with safety on the street. I doubt that. Skipping a few lines, it says, it cannot get done. Listen to this now. Hillcrest and, no, now I cannot even see it anymore. Hillcrest and the side streets have stop sign and is correct. It may not make a lot of sense why there has a stop sign on Morrison Avenue, and Morrison Avenue does not. He cannot go back 35 years and figure out what was at play when they put that stop sign there. But they don't make a practice of removing stop signs, and that would really only be the alternative. 
when you look at the safety report and materials provided by the state. He gets all, that's me, he gets all worked up. That does not mean they don't care because they have given him the answer he wants because I didn't get the answer I want. A few more lines done. But there is nothing that this elected body can do about that stop sign on Morrison Avenue. It is what it is, and in fact, the reports that were professionally presented by the town manager reiterated that there is not a safety issue on Morrison Avenue, and I disagree with that completely. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I have asked on more than one occasion, you know, can I get a a statement from the town engineer because I really believe that that right now, right here, anybody, I, I guess I don't know, but there's lawyers here and there, they don't know anything about engineering. Uh, it's sad that basically the ex-mayor said a lot of things and what bothers me the most that he wasn't misinformed. That's why he spoke the way he did. But what bothers me the most is that the town manager was next to him and he allowed to really say a lot of the things that they are not true. The stop signs on local street is up to the local authority. That's what the sign says underneath. The stop sign on Morrison Avenue and Silas Dean, it says STC, State Traffic Commission. The one on Walker Hill Road and Morrison Avenue states, it's based on the local traffic authority. I'm confused. I talk with the state people, it says, we don't have anything to do with this. It's up to the town. But yet, the mayor says, no, it's up to the state. It's sad. Now, when originally was done the report by the police, the construction on Morrison Avenue was not done. They have moved it to the south. That intersection of Tifton Road and Morrison Avenue does not meet standards based on the 25 miles per hour. And people go 31. That's 85th percentile. I would like a statement from the, again, the town engineer and say in writing that that street, it's, it's safe. Your okay. five minutes is up. You have 20 seconds to Thank finish. Thank you. No, oh, that's okay. okay. I'll Thank be you, Mr. Colantonio. Is there anybody else who would like to speak tonight? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. At the uh, last town council meeting, I was presented with a uh, uh, Four page, page, uh, four page information on some questions that I had, and I suspect all of you folks have received that at that time. I hope you all received, uh, and I appreciate this town manager for putting this together. I have more requests, of course. Um, I hope he also shared with you the uh, 2010 a uh, management letter from Blum Shapiro. Yeah, you don't do that. Okay, no problem, I'll send it to him. But what I'd like to do is talk about this uh, listing of bank accounts administered by external organizations dated December 4th, 2017. That was the night or the day that uh, they sent this, la this information to me. And I, I really question the idea of we having organizations that are not town, not town organizations, town of Wethersfield organizations on this list where town employees are putting some type of effort. Our, our, our systems are handling this, whatever in the world it is. I don't know how much business these people do, but you know, the Wethersfield ski snowboard club. I don't know why in the world they don't go get their own, like everybody else that wants to have a club or an organization, go get their own federal ID number and do their own accounting. The Weathersfield Senior Club 
Same with them. They want to have a club? Go and take care of it themselves. Don't ask the town of Wethersfield to put manpower into it, put energy into it, even be part of our books. They have no business here. The Wethersfield Bar Barracuda, same idea. And if we go back and look at the Student Youth Fund that the Board of Education runs, I don't know why the um, Wethersfield Barracudas, and I believe that's a swimming team, isn't on their books. Same with the, uh, well, Wethersfield Dog Park. Why in the world, if they want to have a dog park, do their own accounting, do their own, own administration, get their own federal ID number. We should not be sharing that with anybody. Men's, Wethersfield Men's Softball League. I'll tell you what, there's not one member in that softball league that can't go to IRS. They're healthy people. They can definitely go and take care of their own business. They can take care of their own accounting. We should not be doing anything. Mikey's place, same idea. We have no business tending to these people's needs for accounting, for keeping track of their books, for giving them our ID number. The ID number is meant for the town of Wethersfield, one and only, not these others. But for some reason, there's 10 more from what the manager says. Didn't you say there were 10, didn't this, this somewhere, you said that there was four here and there's 10 more. God, you wanna? I'll respond later. And, so anyway, the, mayor, the, the manager also provided me with the uh, Blum Shapiro management report. Something I've never seen, and I'm glad I finally saw it. But on the 2010, dated, I think in December, December 27, 2010, they had the non-cash account using the town's federal ID number. 2010. 2016 report has the same thing on there. And it's, been, and it's never been resolved. That's an, extend, that's an exception to the audit. We had fraud risk assessment as well that's mentioned in here on the 2010 and is still on the 2016. In business, the manager would be a new manager taking care of this. We cannot, and, and if you go back and read, and I think I sent you folks, the 2016 or whatever it was, these other, these other issues, these other management reports, and, and for the <clears throat> risk, fraud risk assessment, the first sentence says, it is estimated that businesses, including municipalities, lose up to 7% of annual revenue to fraud. Five minutes yes, is up, so you have 20 seconds to finish. If, 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 if I had a possibility of losing 7% of my revenue, I would put every, energy, every inch of energy or pound of energy I had to resolving and making sure we do not have fraud problems. But this has been going on since 2010. 2016, it's still an exception. And we need to get this wrapped up. We're losing. We don't know how much we're losing, but we're losing we're money. Losing a dime. You're not losing a dime. Well, let me tell Excuse you, this me. is what your auditors say. Excuse me. Not me. Mr. Young, your, yes, your time I'm is done. up. Thank you. But, but thank you very much for that great opportunity to come and see you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak tonight? Seeing none, I'll declare the public comments closed. We'll move on to council reports. Any council members have a report? Councilor Hurley. Um, I went to the Housing Authority meeting last Monday, and they noted that they are in uh, union negotiations right now that they hope to wrap up soon. And also, they're looking at the best way to rehab the property at 55 Lancaster Road. It's totally needs a uh, rehab, but they think it could take two to three years to get the whole building up and going. Thank you. Other council reports? Councilor Rell. The Planning and Zoning um, Commission is meeting tomorrow night. Um, they're hearing a, um, a, 
an item that was carried over from the last meeting on the um, proposed redevelopment of the corner of Berlin Turnpike and Arrow Road. Um, there's a self-storage and a gas station convenience store that might be going in there. Um, I know some area residents uh, had concern about that uh, uh, intersection. Um, planning and zoning is working on that right now, and hopefully they'll come up with a, a recommendation for the developer on that property. Thank you. Councilor Lesser? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, two things. One, I attended the chamber meeting on December 7th, and they talked about that holidays on Maine uh, was that night, which is, those of you who attended was a, was a terrific night. And they talked about their 2018 plans and goals. I did mention that one of the things I'd like to talk to them about working on is uh, some type of business advisory board that links our business community to the schools for things like internships, job shadows, industry tours, learning business, basic business schools. Some towns have that type of program. I think it would be great. For Weathersfield, the second one, and I don't want to steal all of Tony's thunder because he might talk about it, but I did go to the Salute to Business uh, dinner, and I wanted to commend Jeff and, and Peter Gillespie and the whole town staff, Denise Bradley, for a wonderful event. And the only downside of the event is I actually went home with one of the award winners' jackets. I did not <laughs> take my own jacket home. I took uh, Mike Orsini's jacket home from MAO Electric, who won an award for longevity and I won award for being the dumbest person there <laughs> and I and I went home with Mike's jacket and I came back and gave it to him <laughs> other than that it was a fantastic <laughs> evening and I was happy to be there thank you Councilor Lesser <laughs> who can top that report um, Deputy Mayor uh, EDAC met last week they went over all the uh, projects currently going on in town uh, the uh, K Jewelers building is under construction and Pasta Vita and all the others uh, they went over the salute to business, uh, which was a sellout this year. It was a super event. Uh, Councilman Lesser, uh, when you do call Mr. Orsini for some electrical work, the price will be doubled. <laughs> uh, the uh, town calendar is in the works and will be coming out soon. Uh, they went over the facade loan program. During the past year, we closed out uh, eight of those. So, you know, it's a lot of good things with the facade loan. It uh, Beautifies our building, brings us in, in some building permits, and then enhances things on the uh, Silocene Highway and Main Street. And that covers my report. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Breton. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I attended um, on December 5th the library board meeting. Um, at that meeting, they had a presentation of their strategic plan, which um, is for from 2018 to 2023. And the plan was, um, it was impressive, and they, um, prior to formulating that plan, they actually had um, an online survey, five focus groups, a work group, and um, input from the library staff to come up with their overarching vision. Um, and so they are still reviewing the plan itself, and they plan to come here in, I think, February, get on the calendar to present to council. So um, that'll be something to look forward to. And then I also attended the Shade Tree Commission uh, last week, and they're still uh, revising the tree ordinance and plan to come forward with that when they're ready. Thank you. Councilor Spinella. Last week, I attended the uh, public works meeting where we took up uh, a proposed um, ordinance on fracking. Uh, we unanimously voted to um, wait on a decision on that ordinance to get some more information from the Office of Legislative Research, which I understand probably came in today or will come in shortly to the town manager. And we plan on reconvening after we uh, have a chance to review that report and become a little more educated on the subject. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any council comments? Council Latina? I was just curious and I just wanted to put it on the table. Um, there's some new laws coming up in January 1st, and I know that one of them specifically involves the police department with bingo and raffle permits. And I just was throwing it out there as to where we might be with that. I've not heard from the chief, but I don't know that we have too many bingo operations in town. Church. But I will follow up. Yeah, churches, civic groups of that nature. Mm -hmm. It all has to be run, for everybody's knowledge, through the police department instead of the state Department of Consumer Protection. So it's just something we need to prepare for. Any other council comments? 
Um, I would like to just thank the Chamber of Commerce for the holidays on Maine that they put on again this year. The event was a huge success and um, a huge undertaking as well. So I'd like to thank all involved with that. Um, and the, also thank the EDIC for this salute to business and to personally congratulate Dorcas McHugh for receiving the Betty Rosania Service Award. Um, and just to notice that the Weathersfield Band will be picking up Christmas trees on the Saturdays after the holidays, and you can look for information on that from the school website. And we'll move on to the town manager's report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Two things, um, just for the new council members' edification. The study Mr. Colantonio wanted on Morrison Avenue has been done both before and after the sidewalk renovation. So those studies have been done, and the results of those studies have been provided to him more than once. Um, secondly, on Mr. Young's comments, in 2010, there were 14 different groups that utilized the ID number. We've shrunk it down to four. All four of those groups do substantial work for the residents of the town through different departments. Our employees do monitor those accounts, do get the bank, bank statements, and we will move forward with moving them to their own ID number. Um, but they are monitored, and the money does not commingle with the town accounts at all. Uh, with the general fund cash so I get it um, in regard to the fraud audit the town council budget and finance committee as does the Board of Education's finance committee meet as the audit authority and meet with the audit separate or separate from staff each year to review operations so there is a check and balance that happens every year on that audit uh, none of the comments that mr. young has made are material to the audit they are recommendations, they are notices, they are best management practices, and so forth. And over time, we have incorporated many of those into our daily operations. Thank, you for, have, thank you for the clarification. Um, does the town clerk have any communications? Not at this time, no. Okay, thank you. So we'll be moving into council action. The first item is... Um, B3A, approval of a small harbor assistant agreement. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to authorize the town manager to accept this state grant from the Connecticut Port Authority for a placement of the Cove boat launch ramp in the amount of $765,000 and execute the grant agreement and CPM certification form seven. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, and I see we have Kathy Bagley in the audience. If you'd come up, please. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> this grant is through the Connecticut Port Authority. Uh, we had applied for it uh, back in April. We had come to council to get permission to apply for it. Hadn't heard anything in many months and recently got the word that we did get the grant amongst other grants that were awarded for harbor improvements in the state of Connecticut. Uh, our grant is to replace the boat ramp. The actual cost is $865,000. As part of the grant application, we put in a town match of $100,000 from the Cove Preservation Fund, which is where we put the funds that come in from the boating fees. We've been saving that up, and over the years have been using the boating fees to match other grants to improve down at the Cove, such as the docks, the moorings, and we continued to save and we had this money set aside and we're able to use that as part of the match for this grant. And then we got the word that um, this grant had been approved by the state. So now we're here tonight to see if council will approve it to move forward. Thank you. Are there any council questions? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Abstaining? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. The next item is item B for um, unleaded gas bid. Do I have a motion? Motion to award CROG bid number 663 to Dime Oil Company, unleaded gas for $1.8368 1 per gallon plus applicable taxes. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, unleaded fuel bids were opened by Krog on Friday. The results are before you. There's a slight increase for next year that runs from January to the end of December. So these, uh, this will increase next year's budget somewhat, um, but all in all, not a bad increase given the, given the commodity prices. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councilor Rao? Would we be seeing the similar increase in diesel fuel? Don't know. It depends on the commodity pricing at the time. Do we do a similar purchase though? Yes. Just, okay. Yeah, we do a Krog bid for unleaded diesel and natural gas. But natural gas lately for the past couple of years has been just whatever CNG has because the price has been down. Okay. When would we get the uh, bid for diesel? That's in the spring. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Um, are the contracts always for one year, Jeff? Is there a way to lock in a price, perhaps the idea of being a lower price for multiple years, or is it always on a one-year contract? We've seen them at one year. We can ask Krog if they can do a multi-year. I know some electricity contracts uh, for larger users have been for multi-years, uh, but I can ask. Great. Thank you. Councilor Latina. Um, does this cover just town vehicles or are there Board of Education vehicles in this as well? Uh, Board of Ed as well. Okay. Same with diesel, same with natural gas, same with electricity. We bid the quantities together. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anyone abstaining? Motion passes. <clears throat> There are no ordinances or resolutions or appointments for introduction. And there are no minutes? Not this evening. No. Okay. So we will go back into public comment. Just a reminder that you have five minutes to speak. Mr. Colantonio? Good evening again, Gas Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Let me just say a quote. Characters are defined by the action you take when nobody's watching, end quote. Uh, let me make a comment that the only report I got from the town manager is a Wethersfield Police Department report done in 2009. A few years later, or a couple years ago, they did the report, uh, the 10 years back, whatever it is, if you ask me, that was a waste of time. The fact still remains. In 1955, Morrison Avenue did not connect to Silas Dean Highway. 1955, Morrison Avenue was basically designed as a, a neighborhood. It was never meant to connect it. Now, over the years, you have changed everything. The intersection of Tifton Road and Morrison Avenue, it's not safe for 31 miles per hour. And I would like the town engineer to say something because every time I get a report, I don't get a report or maybe there's a few, few words talked right here. I don't believe it. I haven't seen it. The fact still remains. And let me say it again one more time. Tifton and Morrison Avenue, the intersection of the side distance is 232 feet. The traffic is going downhill about 6%. Ah, uh, let me see now. Orchard Head and Hillcrest Avenue, 344 feet and 970 feet. They have three stop signs. Why? The traffic report says that we needed a stop sign in, this, in the westbound direction on Morrison Avenue and Orchard because you could only see 290 going uphill. That's why you need a stop sign. If you see less than that, then why don't you need a stop sign? Does anybody care? I don't think so. You can see it nationwide. <laughs> you know, the politicians are not really looking upon like uh, honest people or caring people. 
I've said that. Now, let me say another thing, too, that basically, back in September, there was an accident on Morrison Avenue and 333 there, the, the corner of building. And, and I came right here and, and I complained. I complained, first of all, I went to the, the police department and I wanted to see the report. It says, you, you cannot see it because there is inform, you know, critical or personal information. But if you want the whole report, you pay $5 and we make you a copy. When I think about it, it says, that's crazy. Did the person being there on the, on the, on the whatever it is in the office got really talked to? I don't think so. But when I made the, you know, my comment, you know, it was in September, and the town manager, and I complained basically that there is a site restriction because there is an evergreen right off the, right, right off the road and just right on the driveway. And I also complained about some bushes on, on Orchard Street that they come over the sidewalk. And, and he mumbled something and he says, no, no, that's been taken care of it. Well, how long is it going to take before they take care of it? That was in September. This is the year, it's almost over. Is there any accountability in town? Does anybody care? Or the only thing you care about is that taxes, to collect the taxes no matter what? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Mr. Young? Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. What I was quoting was coming out of Blum Shapiro management report. Risk assess risk ass fraud risk assessment. It says, it is estimated that businesses, including municipalities, lose up to 7% annual revenue to fraud. Municipalities are especially vulnerable due to the large amounts of cash collected in the tax collector's office. In, addi in addition to decentralized cash collection points, and we can think of games, and it mentions transfer station, golf course, which I, we don't have, and recreation programs. We're subject to fraud. Although, well, I'm, just, I'm not gonna go any further with that, but the fact remains, this has been on their exception list since 2010, and it might have been even longer. It's possible that it's longer because I only have 2010 because I was asking about the non-cash, the non-town cash accounts, which started in 2010. The other, this one here, this risk fraud could have gone even further back and we don't know until the manager provides that to me. And uh, the fact is, this is from your auditors. And then the real nasty part, and I've been wrangling with people up at the Capitol about this, this communication, and I'm wrangling with them, I'm screaming at them up there that this is in our statement. This communication is intended solely for the information and use of management, members of the town council, others within the organization, <coughs> and federal and state awarding agencies and pass-through entities, and is not intended to be and should not be used by any, any one other than these three specific parties. That's a nasty statement for an auditor to put in because he's in a sense saying to the town, don't share this with your, with your citizens. That's my opinion. I'm lucky I found this. And I think it's pretty, pretty bad on the part of our auditor. Now, this other piece of paper that you were given last, at the last meeting, it also goes on to talk about Audit documentation for this engagement is the property of Blum Shapiro and Company, PC, and constitutes confidential information. Now you tell me, what is confidential information in the town of Wethersfield, or any town for that matter? You go behind closed doors, 
to talk about real estate transactions if you're going to buy property or sell property. You go behind closed doors if you're going to talk about personnel matters. Everything else is wide open. Why in the world would your auditors be putting such a statement in their audit? in your engagement letter, wherever it is. It has no business there. This goes totally against <coughs> freedom of information. And you folks, some of you folks probably have never seen these letters. And it's up to the manager to provide that to you. I sent you some letters weeks ago, correct? I think Mr. Lesser, I had his rejected and I had to send it again. But otherwise, you all got it. Have you read that before? And you, and you never talk about it. That tells us that you, you didn't protect the, the public. You should have been screaming about that. I was screaming with internal auditors in Hartford about this. They said, oh, we're, we're aware of that. But it's so bogus, we just pass over on it. Yeah. Serious business. Tell, tell the town not to share it with anybody else but themselves. That's the kind of town and auditors that we have. And we should make sure that the new auditor that comes in is not Blum Shapiro coming forward. And we should also make sure that these issues are on the table, that they're not going to be included, and it has to become public knowledge. We have to know what our town <coughs> officials are doing. If we just listen to the manager, everything's rosy. I mean, he keeps telling us we're financially in great shape. I question that. Mr. Young, you I five, also, yes, five madam. Five minutes is up. You have 20 seconds to finish up. And then, and then we have the alligator ear, a lot, uh, eye uh, pure drops that we had at the last meeting regarding Chromebooks, how you were all, look, you, looked, you looked all distressed that you could not buy Chromebooks until Mr. Rell made the suggestion, let's mortgage it. Let's go on payment plan. And then I says to myself, that explains why I'm not a Republican. The Republicans are the same as the Democrats. There's no difference. Thank you very much, madam. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Young. Is there anybody else who would like to speak tonight? Mr. Sikas? Lee Sikis, uh, 117 Wells Road. I just want to say, uh, being involved with some various groups and committees in town, uh, one thing that's needed more so is, uh, look at the audience here, participation. Mm -hmm. This town used to boast about volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Well, it's more like cheers and volunteering. And I can even remember saying to uh, uh, Bob uh, Callahan, sidewalk inspector, uh, when I have snowy days, and no school, why can't the football team or the basketball team uh, help clear corner cuts, uh, curb cuts and corners for people and businesses? Oh, that'd be like so against the child labor laws. But I remember a few years ago, the town of Milford had volunteers for the community help keep the town you know, accessible for people walking, baby strollers, wheelchairs, whatever. And another thing is uh, many volunteers of people, also volunteers and elected people who, uh, who should be attending more of the meetings that they should be uh, liaisons to. Sometimes uh, being involved with certain groups over the years, a lot of people I know are busy, but uh, having the attendance of uh, not even one out of three meetings is uh, kind of poor no matter who you're uh, working for or uh, representing. It's really a representative. If you can't be there, maybe you should have a liaison there on their behalf. It's really a uh, towns to pull together and work together. And you know, all know what the word she means, T-E-A-M. Together, everybody achieves more. 
But that's together. You've got to be together. And if people aren't coming to meetings or look at the audience here. The audience is uh, barely bigger than the town council. We need more participation, more interest from the public. Not just because of taxes and bills, but of issues of concern. Not just with the complaints, but with suggestions. Because everybody has complaints, everybody has answers. Some are decent, some aren't. But the main thing is, is to talk things over and come to hopefully uh, an improvement for all. I just want to say hopefully uh, things will be better in the coming year. And I hope this term goes well for the town council. I thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Okay, before we adjourn, I just want to wish everybody a happy and healthy holiday season. And I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>